Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Williamson. I am the uh, lead of the Finos Open Source Readiness Program. Uh, we have these meetings once a month where we typically bring in uh, guest presenters who are doing interesting work in open source and financial services or in fields abroad. Um, we're glad to have everyone here today. Looks like a great turnout. Uh, I'm excited today to have with us uh, Roderick Randolph and Arthur Maltzen, uh, both distinguished engineers at Capital One who are uh, who are working on uh, Capital One's intersource process, and they're here today to talk about uh, Capital One's intersource journey. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Roderick and Arthur and let them tell you what's going on at Capital One. Thanks guys for joining us. Awesome. Hey, can you guys see my screen? Let's see. Good. Looks awesome. good. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining the session with us today. Um, as Aaron said, my name is Roderick Randolph. I'm a distinguished engineer at Capital One. And, and I'm Arthur Maltzen, also a distinguished engineer at Capital One. And we're super excited today to tell you a story about how an internally built CI CD pipeline framework grew to become a major inner source product at Capital One. Uh, we'll share with you the lessons we learned that shaped our journey and could help your organization harness the power of inner source inside of your company's walls. So we'll start at the beginning. Uh, many years ago, Capital One followed a waterfall approach to software delivery. We even built and ran our own data centers. We had a painfully long approval process for releasing software changes into production. And the deployment steps themselves were very manual and error prone. It literally took months to get a release out the door. And if we fast forward to today, we operate a lot differently. We have agile teams that are following continuous delivery practices. We're all in on the cloud, which enables our business to be nimble. And most importantly, we've automated our deployment processes so they're safer, predictable, and more frequent. But how exactly did we get here? Our digital transformation didn't happen overnight. It took a lot of hard work and effort from everyone. And the CI CD pipeline framework we built was an important part of the journey. If we hop into a time machine and go back to 2015, Capital One had publicly announced at Amazon's reInvent developer conference that we're moving to the public cloud. And while our digital transformation was already underway at the time that this announcement came out, it was a big moment for our company. And our software engineers were super excited about where we would hit it from a technology standpoint. Uh, sorry. And so around that same time in 2015, across the Great Lakes in Canada, in a relatively small office near downtown uh, Toronto, Capital One was, was actually starting a brand new technology organization, or what we call a software studio. And the intent of that software studio was to transform the way the Capital One Canada business um, operated. And this new studio in Canada had a, a very, had a startup feel to it, and we were going to do all the transformational goals our tech leaders had inspired us to do. And we were going to automate all of the things. And on a more personal note, uh, myself, I actually saw that the studio was an exciting new opportunity and challenge. And so I packed my bags and I, I moved from Richmond, Virginia and, and the States to Toronto to join this team to, to be a part of this exciting new journey. But when we got started on our first few business initiatives in Canada, our developers quickly ran into a few roadblocks as we worked. We, ha we had hired a lot of new developers and they literally needed to learn all the things. They needed to learn how to migrate to apps into the public cloud for a bank. They needed to learn DevOps principles and best practices. They needed to learn how to run containerized workloads. They needed to learn how to use open source software safely and securely and how to automate manual processes. 
each one of these on their own is a challenge. But trying to tackle them all at once is, is very hard for our, the average developer. And oh, did I mention that we're also a heavily regulated bank across three countries? Uh, that means that there's many compliance requirements we need to go through for everything that we do as a company. We soon realized that getting from point A to point B, which in our case was just trying to get an application deployed into production with automation, was going to be filled with twists and turns along the way. And our developer productivity would suffer unless we develop a solution that made their lives easier. And so with that startup mentality that I mentioned when we began in, this, in the software studio, we began to build a, a CI CD pipeline framework that worked for our Canada business using open source software. So we were thinking about the entire developer experience and how we could reimagine our software release processes to make developers' lives easier. We made all of our new framework source code available inside of our internal network using enterprise GitHub Enterprise so that other developers in the office could see the code and contribute features as needed. This was a, was a really exciting time for the studio. And I recall a, a memorable moment where a software engineer who I won't name, but they happened to be a co-speaker of this talk, uh, committed a bunch of new code changes to, to add a brand new feature to the framework. And immediately after the code change, we had other developers running over to our desk complaining that their pipeline builds were failing. It turned out to be a simple syntax error and we were able to fix it quickly. But this is just an example of how, how we were developing the framework very quickly and interacting with our developers to gather their requirements and pain points and solve, solve for them in real time. And it wasn't long after we built our first MVP of the framework that our Canada business launched its first microservice API onto the, onto the cloud with a fully automated pipeline. This was a huge milestone and accomplishment for a team. We knew it was a great start for the business with many more automated deployments to come. And to make the framework feel more mature, we gave the framework a name. And for the purpose of this talk, we'll call the framework Bingo. We designed a cute little mascot for Bingo because what developer doesn't love mascots, stickers, and, and free swag? The news about Bingo quickly began to spread across other parts of the company. Developers started talking to other developers about how they enjoyed the developer experience and how it solved the problems, problems that they were facing. And we knew word was spreading because we had a dedicated Slack channel for Bingo. And a key indicator we used for adoption was how many people had joined the channel. We would celebrate every little milestone. So going from 25 members in a channel to 50 members to 100 to 150, we were seeing natural and organic growth, which was exciting, but we didn't know what was coming next. So as the framework continued to grow and take on new users and new use cases, I actually decided to pack my bags and move back to the US, partly because it was really cold, but uh, it was an opportunity for me to move back into the US. And through that transition, we started to see a huge growth of Bingo. We saw hundreds of developers starting to adopt and use the framework. Bingo was reducing the amount of time it took the teams to release software, it automated away a lot of developer toil, reducing the amount of time it took to deploy new software from months down to weeks, if not days. But we also soon noticed that there were other similar pipeline frameworks being built across the company. At first, I was surprised and bewildered at how many frameworks had been built and what felt like duplicate effort turned out to be developers trying to solve a common pain point. And to put this into context, like any large enterprise, Capital One comprises of multiple lines of businesses. And given the size and scale of the company, it's easy for duplicate efforts to occur, even within the same line of business. 
So case in point, the Canada organization falls under the credit card division, and we were seeing multiple pipeline frameworks sprouting up just in the credit card business. And so within the credit card division, we began to ask ourselves, why do we have so many duplicative pipeline frameworks? Can we consolidate to a single framework? Can we pull all of our talent to, together and solve the problem once and move on to more challenging problems? So this led to a healthy conversation between the various pipeline owners within the credit card division. We came together in a community event that we called a barn raising. And as a community, we worked together to figure out which framework we would standardize on for the credit card division. And so after much deliberation, the community decided to standardize on the bingo pipeline framework that we had built in Canada. And a key decision coming out of the barn raising event was that we we're going to use bingo. We we're going to turn bingo into a formal inner source product. And so for those who may not be familiar with inner sourcing, the main idea is that you take many of the inner, many of the concepts of building open source software and apply them inside your company's walls. So think about public GitHub issues, pull requests, project maintainers, along with other processes and governance. Um, but they're optimized, but it's optimized for how your company is organized. There are a lot of great benefits to inner sourcing. Um, that unlocks collaboration and productivity within your company's wall within your company's walls. So benefits that we've seen is code reuse, um, knowledge sharing to knock down silos between teams that can often occur in a large enterprise. Um, it helps promote higher code quality because we have more developer eyes looking at the software being used inside your company. And just overall better innovation because Everyone is focused on the same goal and feel a part of the solution. Um, if you're new to inner sourcing, I would uh, definitely recommend checking out the O'Reilly book on how to get started with with inner source. So returning to our story, what happened after the barn raising event? Well, imagine the excitement, but also the panic in our faces after we learned that bingo was going to be leveraged by the entire credit card division. A framework that had initially been built for a few hundred developers in a small office in Toronto was now going to be used by several thousand engineers and hundreds of applications in both Canada, US, and the UK. This was by far an exciting time, but also a lot of pressure to make this work. At this point, we had to fasten our seatbelt and scale up our operation, very much like a startup that had just hit the jackpot. We quickly realized that we needed to replicate the bingo team and spread knowledge on how our framework works. And among the first things we did was conduct larger scale boot camps and in person training sessions. This enabled a couple of things. One, it helped educate more developers on how to use Bingo for their, for their business application. But more importantly, teach those who wanted to contribute to Bingo on how Bingo worked under the hood. This education also helped adhere, helped them adhere to many of the core principles that had, been, that had went into the initial development and success of the framework. We also ramped up our mobbing programming sessions where we had multiple developers that would sit together physically or even virtually and develop new features and capabilities in real time together. We also found that there were other areas that needed significant investment, including improving our documentation and expanding our office hour support. Things were moving very fast and then we got hit with yet another curveball. And so this brings me to act three. When a product process or product has been found to work well, it's normal in a large enterprise to figure out how to scale it up, especially the good parts. So remember when I said that Capital One has multiple lines of businesses? Well, just like within a division, there were multiple frameworks. Across divisions, we had even more frameworks. 
And the question we ask ourselves again, why do we have duplicative pipeline frameworks across the company? What if we had a single pipeline framework for the entire enterprise? Imagine the reduction of duplicative efforts and the time saved if the divisions collaborated and worked together. Just imagine that. And that's exactly what happened. All the divisions got together to align on a single framework for the enterprise. And collectively, the, organize, the organization decided to take the framework that was built in the credit card division, bingo, and bring it to the enterprise as the base for all, all other divisions to build upon. And so one of the good parts about bingo was its inner source spirit. So we needed to take many of the lessons that we learned from inner source within the credit card division and scale them for multiple divisions. We thought scaling bingo in just one line of business was difficult, but boy, were we wrong. While bringing the division together, while bringing the divisions together, I remember a moment where the conversation went something like this. Hmm. Our divisional pipeline framework doesn't solve the problem that way. We solve it this other way. And so working through those differences and aligning on aligning on a path were probably the most some of the most challenging parts of bringing the divisions together. But the more uplifting moments were those aha moments where, oh, you do it that way in your pipeline framework? Well, we do it that way too. Let's work together to remove the duplication. And here's another example. We had a team in retail bank that needed a new serverless capability built into the framework. And they were wondering if their use case was supported in Bingo. We said, no, it doesn't exist yet. And their response was, well, we would love to contribute. How do we get started? And so those types of open conversations is really what makes InterSource super viable in a large organization. And to help foster more of those collaborative conversations, we've established what we call a pipeline council. And this council is a group of leaders from each division to represent their division's business needs and to influence the direction, design of the shared enterprise framework going forward. It's, it's a great form for everyone to align on priorities, use cases, roadmaps, and architecture patterns. This really enhances the collaboration between divisions. And like any popular open source project or repo, the number of, of GitHub issues and pull requests against a successful inner source product will feel endless and become very time consuming. And so additional contributors are definitely needed to really scale up. We had a community, community contributor who got to the point where they were consistently contributing multiple high quality pull requests into our GitHub repos. They were also reviewing other people's pull requests and issues and providing feedback. So to reward this contributor who was actively engaged and consistently in, involved, we elevated them to become a trusted contributor. And a trusted contributor is someone who has achieved a special status in our repositories where they are trusted to review and approve pull requests from other contributors. So having a path for users to become a trusted contributor has enabled us to bring others in the community and feel a part, part ownership in the product really, and as well as helped us scale. There's so much more to our story, but where are we today? While I'm not allowed to reveal exact numbers, I can say that Today, we have thousands of developers in our Slack channel, which is a far cry from the small handful of engineers we had initially. We have hundreds of contributors and contributions coming into the framework from across the company. And the framework powers thousands of automated pipeline builds every single day. 
Bingo has come a long way and it's amazing to see how it's grown. But what lessons can you take away on perhaps your journey to growing an inner source product? And I'm going to hand it off to Arthur. All right. Uh, I mean, the first thing to say is thanks, Roderick. Uh, now everybody knows my embarrassing syntax error story. But uh, <laughs> as Roderick was saying, our inner source journey was a winding and honestly, sometimes fraught journey. But what we really wanted to do by sharing it with you is we hope to inspire you to go on your own inner source journey by sharing what we think has helped us succeed in our inner source journey and some of the pitfalls that we fell into. So you don't have to. And we want to share uh, this and, and we believe it's valuable regardless of whether you're just starting out uh, with your inner source product. You've started to gain traction and people are starting to make use of it, or you've really grown to enterprise scale. And now, as Roger kind of said, you're swamped with issues and support requests. And we think that there's three key focus areas that helped us build a successful inner source product. And the first one is exactly that word product thinking about what you're working on, not as a project to just finish, wrap up and move on to something else, but as a product that has continual upkeep, a roadmap and other product ownership best practices to really get the most out of your inner source work that you're doing. The next is to focus on the user. And again, just like any successful uh, customer product, you really need to focus on the user. I think what's unique and distinct with inner source is often the user is actually a developer. So you really need to focus on the developer experience versus just a customer user experience. And those are distinctly different. And finally, just like what makes uh, any open source project successful, contributors are gonna be key to the success of your inner source product. And as Roderick said, the whole point of inner source is to bring many of the lessons learned from the open source world into the enterprise. And again, this is where contributors are key. So let's dive in first to product. We believe that what helped Bingo succeed and what we think many inner source products can succeed is by finding the ones that scratch your own itch. Often these are the ones that have the most staying power because they're addressing a organizational pain point or something that people find cumbersome. And once you invest in these, these are the things that will start to scale and honestly and often address issues across the organization, right? Not just in a specific line of business. The next, as you start to grow, right? So this is, you know, you've, you've found something that scratches your own itch. Now you've invested, it's starting to get bigger and you're scaling more uh, teams, I think at that point, it was really critical for us, and we believe in many cases, to define what your core principles are. Because as you take on more people, they're gonna be new to the culture of your inner source product. And so knowing uh, what the core principles are, what the expectations are in this product, will help people succeed when they make contributions and new teams that onboard to it. In our case, one of well, like we really care about developer experience and an example of one of our core principles was that error messages should be clear and actionable and guide the user on how to fix it and that was just one of many uh, many inner source principles that we wrote down for our bingo product and the next one is uh, actually focusing on the, uh, as you scale to enterprise level, is to figure out how to make major changes to the product while still keeping the big picture in mind. And this is where we actually learned from the open source community like Rust Lang or Swift Lang and others uh, that a RFC process, a request for comments, do the ability to not only and you know in these COVID times make better use of written documentation, right? Rather than a meeting where everybody leaves and everybody had a slightly different interpretation of what we agreed to, right? You write you write it down what major change you want to make, and then 
have that reviewed by people who have originally set those defi defined core principles down and try to keep major changes to your inner source product going in the direction that you expect, but gives the ability for everybody to contribute ideas and approaches. And again, as you get to that enterprise scale, the other big thing to keep in mind is to not lose sight of the details, right? As you really get to that point, you can lose the person in the metaf metaphorical hills here. And that's developer experience of that in engineer is really what's gonna keep the goodwill going and get people excited about contributing and using your inner source product. So, and I'll, I'll be totally honest, right? Once you get to that scale, it is easy to lose sight of that. And so oftentimes you need to remind yourself, hey, we, we really need to sit down with engineers, do an empathy interview and make sure that we're still addressing their core needs. So from a product perspective, quick summary, what we think helped us be successful, finding products that scratch your own itch, defining the core principles as you start to scale and get larger, and at enterprise scale to try to keep the direction uh, is to introduce RFCs and not to lose sight of the details. As we move to the next focus point, the user, as I said, one of the things that's unique about inner source products is that they're often focused on the developer. And what we found really helped us early on, as Roderick kind of alluded to, was that white glove support. So sitting down with the engineer, working through an issue, troubleshooting it, and also showing them, here's how it, like as you're sitting with them, here's how it works inside. Uh, here's some pro tips on using the product. That really started to help uh, build up a lot of goodwill and honestly led to better advocates who helped us scale and expand not only support, but also the reach of the inner source product. I still remember one engineer who's actually still engaged, just uh, was so blown away by how much faster they could get things done with Bingo. And they were advocates across their division and really helped fuel that growth. But the thing is, as you start to grow, what you're gonna find is the manual touch points, the different parts of your, uh, of your inner source product that require, I don't know, a manual step to onboard or uh, some manual processes, they're gonna start to really grind and bring friction to anything that you're trying to do just because you're really starting to scale. In our example, it actually took 20 to 30 steps to onboard somebody on Bingo uh, early on. And those were done manually editing like a really gnarly Jenkins regular expression. It was not pretty. And we actually stepped back and took the time to totally automate that process to the point where it's now a Slack app that developers just chat with the bot, get fully onboarded, and we never even look at it. So that freed us up to focus on fixing bugs and adding features. So automate those frequent touch, manual touch points that are frequent and common. And as you start to get to that enterprise scale, when I mentioned not losing sight of the details as you grow, one common practice in the industry at large is to gauge the net promoter score, the NPS of your customers and see how happy are they with your product. And what you really wanna do is build up more promoters, people who rate your product as nine or 10, uh, when you ask them, would you recommend this to a colleague or friend, right? And you re this, running these surveys on a regular basis gives you an opportunity to find the people who are dis detractors and try to hear out, do empathy interviews with them, understand where they're struggling, but then also empower the promoters to not only engage in using your product, but advocate for it, help and support, and as Roderick said, maybe become trusted contributors. So, one key focus point for us was focusing on the developer, which is often the user. And we found what helped us succeed was early on focusing on the white glove support, automating the frequent touch points as we started to scale, and including a NPS, a net promoter score survey, as we started to scale at enterprise level. Moving on to contributors, and contributors are really the lifeblood of an inner source product as they are the lifeblood of an open source product. And we engage contributors early on 
by building transparency into the inner source product that we are building. We built everything in the open. We did code reviews in the open, tickets, etc. And what the magic that happened from that was I still remember random engineers in Canada just jumping in to a pull request or an issue or an RFC proposal and providing really unique and insightful feedback that really helped us make a better product in the end. As we started to scale and get larger, as Roderick mentioned, the in-person boot camps and in-person training really helped us scale. And I think oftentimes when we do these boot camps, we focus on the how, like why, why, how, how are you doing something? How do you use the product? But I think one of the most valuable things you can do with these boot camps, and you know, when we can do them in person or even over Zoom right now, is in infusing the culture, the why behind your inner source product, because that's going to provide the most value long term. So focusing on those core principles, showing people how do we actually think through these problems, because every product has a somewhat unique culture. And if you want to have a consistent and well thought out product, you want a consistent culture and a consistent way of building it to help push it forward. And, and that's what you really want to infuse in these boot camps and in-person tra training. And as you get to enterprise scale, as Roderick mentioned, what we found helped us scale is to really build that trusted contributor model and start to empower engineers to own parts of the ecosystem. Because honestly, as you start to get to that level, no one person can hold it all in their head. No one person can keep up on all the pull requests. And you really need those trusted lieutenants to go forward and uh, see to the future success of components. And that frees your headspace up to focus on the next thing. And again, at the enterprise scale, another big thing that we feel helped us succeed is focusing on recognition. You'd be surprised how far something as simple as sending a thank you note to that contributor and CCing their manager, how far that goes. Because, you know, unlike open source, we all have managers that we report to. And you as the employee feels really great when your manager knows that you did valuable work and people are recognizing it. So just a simple thank you note really goes a long way. So again, uh, contributors are the lifeblood of an inner source product. And what we found helped us succeed early on was building in the open, being transparent, as we scaled in-person training and boot camps. And finally, at the enterprise scale, a trusted contributor model and really not forgetting about recognition. So those were the three focus points that we feel helped us succeed in our inner source journey. But this wouldn't uh, be, it wasn't all roses and sunshine. We of course uh, had some lessons learned, we bumped our heads. And if Roderick and I could jump into that DeLorean you saw in the beginning and go back and tell ourselves uh, what to look out for, and assuming we listened, what we would tell ourselves is early on, Focus on documentation. Make documentation a key part of your uh, definition of done. Because if you don't keep the documentation up to date, you don't write that documentation, it really comes back and haunts you. And I'll be the first to admit that many developers don't read documentation, but even writing it down and being able to quickly link to it rather than re-explaining the same thing over and over can really go a long way to reduce that support burden. As we started to scale and get larger, we would tell ourselves to keep up with the code quality and keep up with updates. You know, it's it's easy to forget or not forget, but kind of, oh, I'll update Terraform a bit later. Oh, I'll, I'll update this a bit later. Or, oh, okay, we'll let this go through and we'll clean it up later. And as you start to build up that technical debt, it really starts to slow you down in moving fast with your inner source product, just like it does with you know, a cus cus consumer product as well. So the quality and health of your product is the foundation on which you build it. You build everything. So it's really critical to keep that well maintained. And finally, uh, as we got to enterprise scale, we, we would remind ourselves to keep evolving the contributor model 
right? What you decide early on is not necessarily going to work when you get to hundreds of engineers, thousands of engineers. So be mindful that it's okay to sometimes let go or it's okay to change it and improve and just make necessary changes because otherwise you can't scale. So those are our lessons learned and things that we would watch out for if we did it again. More documentation early on, keeping up with the code quality as we scaled and continuing uh, evolving the contributor model. And this wouldn't be a meeting of FinTech organizations if we didn't have something that looks like an Excel spreadsheet. So here's a quick summary of everything we just talked about. Thank you very much. Uh, my name awesome. is Arthur Maltzen. I'm a distinguished engineer, Capital One. And I'm Roderick. I'm also a distinguished engineer, Capital One. Thank you, and, Arthur and Roderick, for a terrific presentation. Sorry, go ahead, Arthur, thank you, you were going to say. Oh, I was just wrapping up. Uh, just here's a few of the resources, uh, links to the slide, the slides themselves, links to the inner source common patterns that uh, Roderick mentioned early on, uh, the book, et cetera, and then just the credits. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so this uh, this edition of the Open Source Readiness Project meeting uh, was uh, co-sponsored by the Intersource Commons uh, group. We have Claire, Dylan, and Denise Cooper with us from Intersource Commons. They've been uh, working with us on co-producing every other Open Source Readiness meeting um, because we've we've found that Intersource is is a big area of interest among our members. Um, we've also just announced uh, the launching of the inner source special interest group at Finos. Um, and so I'm going to put some links in chat um, about that so that you can get more information and join the mailing list and, and check out some of the, um, the uh, information in the GitHub repo. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Denise Cooper from inner source commons, who's going to lead the discussion with Roderick and Arthur about their presentations. Denise, take it away. Hi there. Um, thanks, guys. I knew you would be great, and you were. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, and I find it an interesting story uh, because I was sort of involved in the early days of Capital One thinking about InterSource, um, along with one of my Apache colleagues who was working there at the time in the fellow program. And listening to him talk about how much pushback he was getting um, it, it's really, you know, ingratiating to find out that you guys got there. And I think the magic was probably the CICD as a pathway in. Um, it, it, I think you pretty much said that. Um, it did, were you aware of earlier efforts before the, this project started that you guys got involved with? Yeah, so we've had, um, we've had a number of, so this Pipeline framework wasn't actually our first inner source um, product, if you will. We've actually had a number of, of smaller products that had an inner source kind of um, uh, feel to it. This one's a little bit different because we actually had to, it was more of a, we had higher level um, sponsorship, if you will, from the executive level to make this a enterprise inner source product. And so that really kind of accelerated and, and, and part of the reason why we were panicking and trying to figure out how do we do these, how we would make this actually work. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a journey for, for Capital One. We've, you know, I've been at the company for quite some time. I've seen us actually, everything was closed book, you know, everything was offshore, took yeah. forever to release and then kind of seeing where we are now, where we've actually to kind of author's point, have more transparency in what's 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 happening within the company and being able to contribute to and influence products has been a really um, huge transformation for us. Yeah, no, you definitely got there and that's really exciting. But the reason I'm asking the question the way I am is because one of the leading causes, in my opinion, of failure of intersource programs is unrealistic time time duration expectations on the part of the senior managers that are that are usually backing the thing. Um, it takes a while. And it, a lot of that is finding the magic itch that everybody has to scratch 
which is why CICD has been so popular as an inroad because it's the hotness now. Yes. Um, if, you know, 10 years ago, it would have been agile, would have been the way that you get in source, inner source in, you know, right? But um, so I'm really glad you guys found it. But I want to just, for the people that are watching, I want you to know that most of the time, it's going to be a longer road than you think. Yes. There are definitely, yeah. you know, all along the way, you can see those small wins that you can, that you can celebrate. But then there's also the problem of once the company comes to decide that this is a good idea, how the heck are you going to scale it? And in my experience watching several companies do this now, the, a lot of the problem is that the people who usually prove to the company that it works are not the people who specialize in communications inside the company. And so figuring out, I always tell companies, if this is going well, you're in the middle of your first experiment and you're already really jazzed, by all means, bring in a comms expert right then to learn how to communicate it to the rest of the company because it's not going to be simple. Agreed. So how did you I, guys I, do that? How did you how did Denise, you that comms problem? Denise, I've got a really interesting point here as well, which is how do you get that senior management Buy-in. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? So, part of the buy-in was um, senior leaders saw the, re, you know, the redundancy, right? The inefficiency in the organization. Like, it, it just this kept popping up. Teams are spending so much time reinventing the wheel, and how do we bring these? these folks who are constantly building these things from the ground up together to work together, right? So it was partially us having a great idea of wanting to automate our processes, but it was also, you know, pitching the idea, hey, there's so much um, waste going on in the, in the environment that if we all kind of collaborate together, we would be a lot more successful. And so, you know, you translate that to dollars, Right to, to things that actually affect the company, and and you have a a business case to to move forward. Yeah, I think I, I think it's that. really like once once they see the value. I mean, oftentimes with senior leaders, you can pitch them an idea, or you can bring them. Hey, I've already got this working. Right, it's the ask for forgiveness, not permission. Right, I got this working. Check this out. We can actually deploy to production in a day rather than a month, which is how long it takes today, right? And it's that that ability to show something that works that really helps drive uh, buy-in from senior leaders, if they then, care about what, the growth of the company, ultimately, which yeah, you hope they well, What we've seen in JP Morgan, or I've seen, is uh, we've got a number of big projects that have been successful, but it's the ones where the manager who actually within his division have developed a piece of code that's not his interest. Mm. That's the challenge. You've got something that actually is a really good idea, but no one's willing to actually sponsor it. And I just wonder whether you had any, any techniques that you use. You know, so I, I think we really need a central panel with resource that would take that on mm -hmm. and say, well, look, if you're not willing to do it, we have a central team. Do you have anything like that where you have a team that will soak up those ideas and take that ownership? Yeah, I think he's asking if you have an inner source program office. Which we do now, but we didn't at the time, right, Roderick? Like when this happened early on, I think inner source was more of like a word that we used to say, hey, contributions are welcome. And then I think the inner source office came a bit later after we saw all of the uptake of inner source products in the Yeah, we have, so we have a we have an open source office and we also have an inner source um uh, community, if you will, that's driven through from architecture. So a lot of this is, hey, you know, how do you optimize? How do you have common patterns for how you build software at the company? And so a lot of these ideas are brewing out of the architecture um, division or, or area, right? So, um, and that's that's a place where we actually talk through ideas, patterns. And, and really foster um, the collaboration within the organization. Um, but yeah, to Arthur's point, we didn't have that, but we we now have that, and there's been you know um, 
because there's value in in having these these forms for folks because there's always ideas out there right and and a lot of folks have some a lot of engineers have similar ideas is how do we bring these people together so that yeah we but you're talking something. about democratizing that process so you're you're skipping levels usually to have the real conversations and that's often a cultural no no that you have to break through you have to do it um, but I, I want to get back to some of the questions that were asked during the talk because we had people sending really good questions in. So um, there's a question about sort of a baseline. What was a lead time for a commit uh, deployed to production before you guys did bingo? Like what kind of time did you save? Um, so we were, it was actually probably a quarter. <laughs> To get something into production prior to having our framework, like it literally took a lot of coordination time um, and steps to get something out. And what we've part of the part of building the framework was also figuring out our like, what are the gates that software needs to go through to feel comfortable? Hey, this change can actually go out in an automated fashion. So making sure we have the right testing um, in place and so forth. So it took a while to get to get that built out, um, but once a team has that foundation in place, today it, it takes some, like to Arthur's point, they can deploy within a day, sometimes within an hour, depending on how, how fast the, the change needs to, to go out. Um, so yeah, we were, we were very slow and we've, we've and we, even today, I think, um, you know, an hour is probably not the fastest <laughs> in my mind. I would love to go a little bit faster than that, but um, it's, it's been it's been a, um, a a journey for sure. Yeah, that's great. Okay, here's somebody who wants to know about and the, the, Denise. Just, just yeah. to that to that point, I, I, to what Roderick was saying, and I think to reiterate what you said about how this takes time, it really took maybe three, two, three years just yeah. to even get to that point. Right. Right. And then as it scales, we're not even fully scaled enterprise wide. And it's been over four years since bingo started. So that's right. Yeah. So that's these my things point take time. We have to make it well known out in the industry that we're not making. Um, I used to see the promises that were being made by agile um, trainers, and they always seemed really ill advised to me because I never saw that happened in real time and it make, made some people unhappy. So I, I want to be really clear. This is a cultural change that is going to take some time. Um, but, the, but the rewards are huge, so it's worth it. Okay, here's somebody who is, wants to know how connected the inner source journey at Cap One is to doing real open source. Um, so they are separate today. Um, uh, but I, I actually know the guy who who runs our open source office um, program, and we we constantly have um, interactions um, and talk through kind of the, the challenges, right? So we've as we were scaling up inner sourcing, we were we wanted to replicate some of the ideas that were in the open source space as well, and so we have we have that constant, you know back and forth of sharing ideas. Um, but in terms of, hey, let's take what we have in our source and make an open source product, like I don't, you know, that's that's a whole separate conversation. Um, but we do try to share ideas and, and make sure um, we're both learning from um, each other. I think a big, a big difference I see in inner source and, and open source is um, I mean, open source is a lot larger, um, a lot more people, a lot more diversity across different um, companies, right? The culture is going to be different. And inner source is, is, you know, within your company's walls, so you have a lot more influence there. But there's also a lot more pressure to, to ship and get things done quickly, um, uh, just, just from, from experience. So... I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah, I think I, I tell people all the time that I see it helping people stuck inside proprietary organizations to frame better 
um, ideas about how to collaborate in the open source space. I saw that happen at PayPal and I've seen it happen a few other places as well. Um, and there are many open source activists who have been hesitant to get involved in InterSource because it feels counterproductive because its prime directive is not more open source, right? And, and as you guys know, my thing, I have two things. One is we have to save engineers. Engineers, we need more maintainers than we have by a scale of magnitude that the school system and natural growth of open source is not going to address. And, we, and the kinds of people that want to do maintenance are not the rabbits of the world, right? They're, they, and the, a lot of them live in corporations. And getting them to understand why maintenance, would, you know, how to do that in a collaborative way, and that it's not terrible. A lot of people go in thinking they're going to hate it and end up loving it. And, and then they become potential people that might decide to do open source, you know. So anyway, let me let me move on because we only have seven minutes left and we still have some really good questions waiting. Um, okay, what are some concrete recommendations for enterprise architecture as opposed to development um, to champion inner source? In other words, what should the architects of a given company be doing to enable this? Yeah, so one of the unique things about architects, right, they, at least at Capital One, there's, we have different levels of architects, right, um, but they are the folks who kind of see the big picture, right, they kind of see the, the patterns being developed across the company or, or across with, with, within a certain domain, right, um, so even in my current role as, as this distinguished engineer, I'm constantly seeing, hey, someone has this idea, um, how someone else has a similar idea, like pulling these things together and, and thinking bigger picture of, okay, how does, how can I- Connecting people. Connect, right, how can I connect people as well as connect ideas and solutions, right? So. I think architects has a plays a huge role in that because they have that unique visibility across the organization, um, and and that's really like, and and leaders executives listen to architects, right? Mm -hmm. They value their opinion on how things should be developed and, and built, and so I think that's a a key area for for intersource to 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 kind of. Um, Plant that seed, if you will, and and, and grow. Yeah, and I, I I'd say that you really want architects to talk about the value of reuse, right, and get people mm -hmm. reusing. And I think one of the most valuable things architects could do is just like the um, Martin Fowler and ThoughtWorks puts out that uh, thought, uh, tech radar every uh, every six months. You could have a similar tech radar internally in your company with, you know, adopt, hold, uh, trial, et cetera, that model, but for the, both the vendor products that you're using, but also the inner source products within your organization. And that can really help promote that reuse and uh, that inner source culture. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Okay, this is the last of the queued up questions and it's probably gonna take the rest of the time. So I want to, before I ask it, I want to say um, thanks again for doing this great talk for us, guys. And also thank you for your service as leaders of um, InterSource Common SIG or um, Phineas InterSource SIG, which of course is just starting. And, you know, as a necessary piece of that puzzle, we had to find other Phineas members that were interested in this. And Capital One was very quick to say, we really want to help with this. So thank you so much. It's, it's great. Um, all right, so this is a question about um, regula regulated industries and being in a bank, <laughs> okay? So and some of it, and I find, because, you know, I worked for a, a regulated bank, right? Um, there is some mis misconception and yes. some really old school yes. thinking about what that means, regulated industry. But the, let me frame the question, and then you guys can have at it. How do you address the all the code should be private since it has it could have secrets in it problem? And then how do you address the challenge where engineers are assigned to a particular project and not allocated time to work on other things? And I think I think it's not so much time as access to the secrets that I, he's trying to get at. So have at that one, guys. 
Yeah, um, it's it's the challenge <laughs> for sure, um, even for us. Um, and so these this I'll address the secret thing first. One is um, like I think there's patterns for making sure secrets aren't in your repository. Like we we follow those best practices to make sure like credentials and and you know things that that shouldn't be exposed aren't exposed. Um, but the source code itself, right? We don't consider that secret, if you will, if it's within the company's walls, um, because that's like everyone is trying to solve uh, a problem and get things done. And right, if you and if you close things off, it actually creates more problems than it does opening it up, right? Like, in fact, the fact that you have the code available for you know, our security folks to look at and assess and other developers to look at and assess and say, okay, this looks like this could potentially have a vulnerability here. Like it, it just brings more transparency and it gets those issues resolved quicker. So that's on the, on the secrets uh, space. And, and, and that's really like part of the value of open source, right? When the code is open, you really benefit from the wisdom of the crowd. And while it's a smaller crowd, obviously internally, you still do get people finding, hey, you have a, you're not up to date with this library, or you you might have a hole here, and and people do actually send pull requests yes. and pick things up. And if you if you save and memorialize those questions, then you're showing evidence of due diligence that probably wasn't happening before. Yes, yes, right. That's true. Yeah. That can help advocate for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think that we are at the top of the hour, Alex. Yeah. I, I think that the timing one is is just really quick. You can basically say that developers don't necessarily get time to work on something, but if they really enjoy that work, they're going to find time. You know how developers are, right? So if you make it a pleasant and exciting process to contribute to that inner source product, developers will make time even if their manager doesn't give them time. Yeah, and I will also say that you also need a dedicated like you can't just do inner sourcing with Side just hoping people will yeah. contribute you also need True. a team that's focused and helps the community make contributions so to arthur's True. point like if you make that process really easy you will have folks contributing um and if you reward them they'll also they'll come back and contribute again right so this is constant uh incentive incentive to to want to be a part of the product yeah, it's so much better when people are happy with their work, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much again for this session. And I hope everybody that enjoyed this will come again to the next one of these. There, we're committed to doing um, quite a few of them in this, this coming year. And also go out and check out uh, intersourcecommons.org. You can go there with your with your not work email address. We don't care. It's it's uh, it's a public resource. It's a nonprofit. We just want to give you the information. So. All right. Thank you, everyone who joined. Thank you, Roderick, Arthur, and Denise. And we'll see you uh, in a month at our next Open Source Ready This meeting, everyone.